The problem with the planning graph heuristics we have looked at is that they are not very accurate, especially where the goal consists of multiple conditions. Pattern databases can result in very accurate heuristics, but there is a lot of overhead involved in computing the database, and they're usually only for one specific goal, so if the goal changes we need a new database. Now we will take a closer look at the heuristic used by the FF planner. FF was developed by Jörg Hoffmann, who presented this week's feature. And the heuristic it uses is quite remarkable because it is both efficient and accurate. So, let's have a look at the FF Planner. The first thing to note about FF is that it performs a forward state space search, which is the technique we've described in the second week of this course. That means the planner starts from the initial state and generates more states going forward into the search space until it encounters a gold state. And the basic search strategy can be a star in FF, but there is a second strategy implemented, and that is called enforced hill climbing. Enforced hill climbing is a kind of best first search where we commit to the first state that looks better than all the previous states we have looked at. One advantage of this technique is that it copes well with search spaces that have large plateaus, that is, large sets of states that all have the same evaluation function value. And this is quite often the case in forward state space search. However, the early commitment taken by enforced hill climbing can lead to degrees of suboptimality. And in the worst case, it cannot give us solutions at all, namely, if the search space contains dead ends. But this segment is about advanced heuristics, so let's take a look at the relaxed problem heuristic, which is the heuristic used by FF. So, the first step is to construct a relaxed problem that we need to solve as part of our computation of the heuristic. And the relaxed problem used by FF is one where we ignore the delete lists of all the operators. So we take our original problem, and remove the delete lists, the negative effects, from all the operators, and this is our new problem that we use to compute the heuristic. And the important thing here is, to solve this relaxed problem, we only need polynomial time. That means the heuristic is efficient to compute. And the solving of the relaxed problem works in two steps. The first step is a forward chaining step, where we build something that is similar to the planning graph we've seen earlier. But this time it's a planning graph for the relaxed problem that contains way fewer edges and information. Then in the second step we chain backwards from the last layer in this graph to extract our relaxed plan from this graph. And while the forward chaining is quite similar to what graph plan does, the backward chaining is actually quite different. The result of backward chaining is a relaxed plan, and then to compute the heuristic, we simply take the length of the relaxed plan, that is the number of actions in that plan, as our heuristic value. That is the relaxed problem heuristic, or ignoring delete list heuristic, used by FF. Another improvement implemented by FF is that it prunes its search using helpful actions, and in that way it uses information gained during the computation of the heuristic to improve the search. Another important technique, but not related to advanced heuristics, so we won't go into details here. And here is the idea of the relaxed planning problem applied to ex the example we have used earlier. What we see here are the three operators from our simplified dock worker robot domain where the robots had cranes to load and unload containers. And to compute the relaxed prime problem, we simply remove all the delete lists, that is the negative effects from all the operators. So we remove the not ARL from the first operator, then not in CL and not unloaded R from load, and not loaded from the final operator. It's that simple. What this gives us is a planning problem that contains some magical objects. For example, looking at the first operator where we move the robot R from location L to L prime, the precondition is that the robot is at location L, and as a result of this operator, we will have the robot at location L prime. But because we've removed the negative effect, the robot would still be at location L, so it's now in both places. 
and the same goes for the containers in the other actions. The containers, after a load or an unload action, remain in the place where they used to be, but they are also in the new place where we just put them with this operator. And that's the problem we need to solve to compute the relaxed problem heuristic. And here is the pseudocode that performs the forward chaining and computes the relaxed planning graph. And this is defined by a function compute RPG for relaxed planning graph that takes as input a planning problem and this is already the relaxed planning problem. Then the first thing we do is some initialization and we start off with a set of fluents. These are state propositions that hold in the initial state and we have an index t that tells us where in our planning graph we are. And this is followed by a loop that extends our planning graph with one action layer and one proposition layer at a time. This is this loop here. And the first thing we do in this loop is increase the index of the layer we're currently working on, that's here. Then we compute the next action layer, which consists of all the actions that have their preconditions satisfied in the preceding proposition layer or layer of fluence f. So that gives us the next action layer AT and then we need to compute the next proposition layer FT and we start by initializing that with the propositions that were true in the previous proposition layer FT minus 1. And then we go through all the actions in our preceding action layer and add the positive effects that come with these actions to our layer of propositions giving us an extended layer of propositions. Then there are two ways in which this can terminate. The first one is given as the condition in the while loop up here and that says we terminate when all the goal conditions are part of our last proposition layer that we generate here. And the other condition is down here that says when our proposition layer is no longer increasing then we can return failure because that means we're still in the loop so our goal conditions are not part of the last proposition layer and we don't increase that layer and therefore we can return failure. But if we terminate this loop normally, which is here, then we go to the next statement after the loop which simply returns the relaxed planning graph we have generated here. While this is somewhat similar to the expansion of the planning graph, you will have noticed that we're not computing any mutex relations here. And that also means that our relaxed planning graph will be smaller than the planning graph generated by GraphPlan because this condition for termination is actually much simpler and we terminate sooner. Now that you've seen how to compute the relaxed planning graph, here is the function that extracts a plan from this graph and returns its size as the heuristic value. And the first input to this function then is the planning graph, all the layers including proposition layers and action layers, and the goal that we're trying to achieve in this planning graph. And the first thing we do in this function is test whether our goal is contained in the final proposition layer. If it isn't, then of course we can return failure because there can be no plan in this graph that achieves the goal. Otherwise, we continue by computing the last layer in this planning graph that we still need to consider, and that's what the variable m has. And the way we compute this is that we use a new function, first level, which we haven't introduced yet. So this function takes here a goal and the layers in the planning graph and tells us in which layer this goal first appears in the planning graph. So it gives us the index of the first layer of this goal in the planning graph. And m is then simply the maximum of all the values for all the goals. Then we can start with the backward chaining. And the way this function works, we don't simply start at the last layer, but we start in different layers, and we don't just move one layer at a time towards the initial state, but we can actually skip several layers, and here's how that works. We use the variable gt to hold all the goals that need to be achieved in proposition layer t. And we initialize the different sets gt with all the original goals that were given to the function. And we do this by going forward through the planning graph, which is what this loop here does, and we add the goal component gi to the set gt 
if it appears in the layer T for the first time. So if the first level in which GI appears is indeed T. And now that we've assigned all the goals to the different sets GT, we can go backwards through the graph starting from layer M to 1 and search for actions that achieve these goals in the corresponding layers. And if we are in layer T, then the goals we need to achieve are stored in the variable GT. And what we have to do is find actions for each component of that layer GT. So for each GT, we need to select an action that achieves that goal component. And that means GT has to be a positive effect of that action, of course. But we have a further restriction on the set of actions we can choose from. Namely, that the action also must appear for the first time in this level T. So this is what this function computes. The first level of A in all the action levels must be T. And then, once we have chosen an action, of course, we need to add all its preconditions as subgoals to our structure G. And what we do is, we don't just add the preconditions to the preceding layer, which would be T minus 1, as new goals, but we may skip several levels. And the level where we add this precondition P is simply the level in which P first appears in our planning graph. So this is the minimal index such that P is in the proposition layer. That is the index where we add P as a new goal condition to our set G. And of course, this loop terminates when we've reached T equals 1, because F0, of course, corresponds to our initial state. And then, after we've finished with this loop, all that remains is the final step, and that is to count all the actions in our extracted plan and return that as the heuristic value. Now, you have seen the heuristic computed by the FF planner and used for its search. Here is a summary of the result. The heuristic that we've computed is, of course, not admissible. That means FF is not guaranteed to return a minimal plan. But this heuristic is quite accurate. And that means FF finds a plan reasonably fast because it has to explore a smaller portion of the search space than planners that use a less accurate heuristic. And also, the heuristic is efficient to compute because, as you will have noticed, both the functions I've just introduced can be computed in polynomial time. The overall result can be summarized quite nicely with the following statement that I've taken from Jörg's slides that he's using at his home university. And this reads, Almost all current successful satisfying planners use variations of some of these ideas introduced in FF. And here's a quick summary of what we've learned about advanced heuristics. The first heuristics we've looked at are simple planning graph heuristics that can be extracted more or less directly from the planning graph, but are not very accurate. Then we've looked at pattern database heuristics, which are very accurate, but have significant overhead in their computation, which can be done before the search for a plan. But they're also not very flexible in that the database needs to be recomputed for different goals or different objects in the domain. Then we have had a look at the FF planner and specifically at the heuristic it uses, which is based on the idea that we solve a relaxed problem in which all the delete lists have been removed from all the operators. And this is really one of the state-of-the-art heuristics that is used in planning today.